Got it. Welcome to June 29, Tuesday, June 29, our class session, Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations at Delta College. And we're coming up on really, really good stuff today, but we're going to slug through some hard calculations. Uh, these are, you know, major topics that are on my mind, but we are not going to talk about convolution today. Probably get into it tomorrow. But I'm just saying this is what's kind of left to be done in the course. And I think even as it helps you address tonight's homework, I think that the major skill right here is prepping and juggling constants in Laplace transforms. So yeah, this is in the context. Everything here is in the context of Laplace transforms. So Laplace transforms, all of our analogies that we've thrown out so far, it's like a machine that eats differential equations and spits out answers, particularly linear differential equations, even linear systems you might find in a future class, and differential equations, linear differential equations with complex or messy driving functions. So when we advance to second order equations today, we're going to look at sines and cosines, some more advanced constant juggling, and more advanced use of the second shifting theorem. I did post, I think I posted two emails last night, and one of them, I think the second one was called second shifting theorem trick. That is a key email. It has, you know, content that I want you to process. So make sure you read through that, but we'll certainly give a demo of that today. So let's just do some problems. That's the only way we can do this. And the other thing I want to say when we do the problems is this is very, very visual stuff because sometimes it's hard to check in the traditional ways like differentiating and checking. But we can always check by visualizing the solutions, the pieces of the solutions, comparing them against each other. So that notebook, the mathematic notebook I gave you called Dirac and Heaviside Forcing, that is a key notebook. Okay, let's jump right into this. I'm going to show you a cute little uh, partial fraction decomposition trick. So let's pick up a very innocent looking equation. Second order. And uh, yeah, let's start out making it non-threatening here with the forcing function. So this will not be a threatening forcing function. And by non-threatening, I mean that the forcing function is pretty much good to go with the second shifting theorem. You see a clear shift and delay of one second. Shift, delay, clearly one second. Now, if this one and this one weren't the same, like this was a two or a three or a zero, then you don't see the thing prepped for the second shifting theorem. But we can handle that very easily. That was the subject of the email, and we will do a demo of something like that. Let's give you some mellow initial conditions, like uh, can't know what to say here. How about two and one? Yeah, let's try two and one. And then let's prepare the solution, and then let's graph it, and make sure that we see everything demonstrated here, including the initial conditions in our graph. OK, let's roll. So apply the Laplace transform to both sides of this equation. And I'm going to start to do these things in this nature. Oops, sorry, I got to let someone else in the court. I'm going to start to do these things in this way that I'm going to start to just linearly separate these as we go, right? So I should naturally write Laplace transform of y double prime plus four times Laplace transform of y prime 
plus three times the Laplace transform of Y. So you could say I'm skipping a step writing L on the outside, but I'm not really skipping a step. I'm just directly applying linearity. Over here, I will factor out the constant and feed this function directly to the second shifting thing. So this is prepping you for the advanced second shifting theorem trick next. Now, here's something you gotta be very careful about, that these are three separate pieces. And remember, you pay for the Laplace transform of a derivative by working in the initial conditions. But the thing that people sometimes totally screw up is don't forget that there's modifiers outside here like a four. So in the first term, it's not hard to say s squared minus, I'm sorry, s squared L of y minus s y at zero minus y prime at zero. That's this piece right here. And usually when you get used to this, you don't have to do this. You just, I don't write y of zero and y prime of zero when I'm doing this, I just bring these numbers in. But that also means I have to respect these signs. If one of these was minus, that alters the sign here. So you can bring it in directly if you want. I want you to see me write the formula for this reason. Because on the next one, when I say plus four, you have to respect that that four belongs to both the SLY and the initial condition. Many people will write four SLY, but then just write minus Y of zero without respecting the parentheses. Remember the four belongs to the LY prime. Four belongs to the Laplace transform Y prime. So the four belongs to this whole expression. In the third case, there is no undoing to be done. There's no modification of this. So three is just sitting on the outside. How many colors can I use in a single problem? Let's take the Laplace transform of this. The delay introduces a e to the minus one s. And this, I'll write it above very clearly, e to the minus s times Laplace transform of the original unshifted version of this, which is e to the minus t. The Laplace transform e to the minus t is familiar to us. You write one over s plus one. By the way, we will go back all day to our Laplace transform sheet, which you understand we've covered pretty much everything on this Laplace transform sheet, except for the convolution theorem and a couple of mop-up problems right here. We might get to this one today, the Laplace transform of the Dirac function, if we get to talk about the Dirac function. So lots of stuff here, let's organize. So again, I'm gonna totally cheat right here and pull out all the LYs. I, it's not cheating, I'm just being efficient and you will be efficient too after you get used to doing this. So that's that. Now I got to collect all the constants I paid with. So this y naught is two. So there's a minus two s. Then there's a minus one. And then be very careful. This is a minus two times four. This is a minus eight. On the other side, is a two e to the minus s one over s plus one. That two is a factor, whether it goes outside or inside on top of the fraction, I don't particularly mind. Sometimes it's helpful to have it inside on the fraction. It's a factor, a constant factor, so it gets moved around pretty much where we want it. Even this is spending an extra step in writing, but I don't think it's wrong to spend this extra step in writing. I could have just said two s minus nine and tossed them over to the right side right away. So I am sometimes skipping steps, sometimes writing steps in this. 
you will do that as you feel comfortable. Okay, now here comes the dividing and we'll get you this nice partial fraction decomposition trick. So what we're looking at is L of Y is 2S plus nine. By the way, we've been previewing this in our minds. We already knew that this factored into S plus three and S plus one. But we divide both terms on the right side. And I think I will send the two inside to help me work this out. We'll see if it helps. But the difference inside the exponential wrapper is S plus three and S plus one squared. Okay, now I'm ready to execute partial fraction decomposition. And I've said to you that I don't, you can show me, you can just show me the result of your partial fraction decomposition. You've got a calculator, you've got Mathematica, no problem. But sometimes it's not bad to practice doing it yourself. So I'll do this one myself with some shortcut methods. Uh, you always want to check your work anyway, too, right? How do you check your work after you do the partial fraction decomposition? You can add them together, right? But I'm going to use what people popularly call the cover-up technique here. I'm not a great fan of the cover-up technique. But there's nothing wrong with it. I personally usually prefer to cross to multiply across and get rid of fractions. It's just my hatred of fractions. So the idea here is if I plug in minus three right now, I screw up both sides. But logically, uh, double check, I, I think I had that. David, you lost your square, yeah. This one is here. I'm gonna work on this one first. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. No, no problem. Gotcha. Yes, but I will have to mine that square. Okay, so uh, cover-up method le is legal, and this is the reason why it's legal. If I plug in minus three, of course I screw up both these fractions, but if I multiplied everybody by S plus three and then plug in, well, an S plus three will eat this whole term alive when I plug in minus three, and minus three will give me a number here, and after I've crossed this out, it'll give me a number here. So this is the legal basis of the cover-up method. So when I put in a minus three to this term on the right side, I get three in the numerator and a minus two in the denominator. So this makes us minus three halves. Now, same speech when I plug in minus one now, pretending I'm multiplying by S plus one. So this would eliminate this term. So S plug in minus one, I get seven over two. And then a quick cross multiplication will show you that this works because what you'll do is pick up four over two S's and you'll pick up minus three halves plus 21 halves is 18 halves, which is nine. So that's clearly correct. Now, this is the sneaky trick I'm gonna show you. Not too sneaky, not that much of a trick. Some people fear the power of two here because they say, oh, this is gonna make my work extra. I can't use the cover-up method. Actually, you can use the cover-up method judiciously in this case. So just for your personal edification, you're gonna to have to have an S plus three fraction. And the pain is that you have to have an S plus one fraction at the second power and the first power. But now use the same logic that I said a second ago. Well, first of all, I can multiply everybody by S plus three, and that would wink out these two terms when I plug in minus three. It would also wink out these two pieces when I plug in minus three. I'm trying to use all my fingers. So I get plugging in minus three, 
2 over 4, which is 1 half. But now when I want to deal with the s plus 1s, I do not get to do that twice. I can do it once. Let's pretend you multiplied everybody by s plus 1 squared. That would wink out these people. It would wink out this. And it would wink out this. Now you can plug in minus 1 and get 2 over 2, which should be 1. And now comes the trick. So everybody's got their favorite partial fraction decomposition tricks. You think you're up Math Creek because you've already used the minus 1 card. Oh, let's try something entirely different. Let's think about this logically. You only have one constant missing. And these are two rational functions. These are two rational functions that you're demonstrating are equal. But think about this. If two functions are equal, then they're equal at every point. That they're defined. So now the sneaky card you could play right here is just pick a number. Just pick a raw number. And it's not going to be pretty, but let's try s equals 0. What does the left-hand side become if s is 0? 2 over 3 times 1, which is 2 thirds. And what does the right-hand side become if s is 0? 1 sixth plus 1 plus c. And by that method, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, you can now determine what c is. 4, 6, 1, 6, 6, 6, 7, 6, minus 3, 6. Is c minus 1 half? I think so. Now, there's absolutely no reason to gamble with this, right? So what we're going to do is, uh, you know, just yank up your calculator or yank up your, uh, oops, sorry, press the wrong button, yank up your Mathematica notebook. Uh, I won't do this all day today. I'll just say, for once, let's practice using this function apart. 2 divided by open, close, open, close, open, close, raised to the 2, s plus 1. Make sure everybody's seeing this. Yes, they are. And s plus 3. That's right. Did I say that right? And I want Mathematica to do this with you. I'm missing a parenthesis, am I? Nope, I'm OK with respect to s. Mathematic is smart and dumb, right? You know, it's very smart that it can do this instantly, but you have to actually tell it what variable you're using. So do I have my numbers? I have the 1 half minus over s plus 1. Yes, I have the 1 over s plus 1. I have the 1 half. Yes. So this is confirmed. OK. So I'm going to stop sharing. I can leave that Mathematica notebook open for my own benefit, right? Sitting on the desktop. So, David, you don't have to tell it with respect to S. Oh, don't I? OK, let me check that. Thank you. I, OK, that's I, for all I know, that must be a relatively new one, because I thought previously I did have to do that. OK, thank you. Uh, good. So I'm going to leave that open so I can cheat quote unquote. It's not cheating, it's confirming. Don't use technology to do things for you, use technology to confirm. So let's now, this is going to be much easier that we have our uh, coefficients. Now let's do the build out. And this is minus three halves. I'm going to write these things really nicely. Plus seven halves. Got it. Then plus the e to the minus s, the exponential wrapper. Got it. 
and the exponential wrapper is on one half and one and minus one half. I almost spaced it perfectly. And I'm doing this color coding to emphasize the Laplace transforms that I know by heart. Make sure I put everything in the right place. Because this is called prepping the transform. You can do partial fraction decomposition without showing me anything, but sometimes you need to actually manipulate and prep these coefficients, which would be the next problem. So if you have to manipulate and prep the coefficients, show that to me. Here, prepping the coefficients simply amounted to uh, writing them neatly and cutely, I don't know. So, so here we go, we're decoding minus three halves e to the minus three t. That's where that came from. Plus seven halves e to the minus t. But now we have to do second shifting theorem in reverse. We're gonna have to shift and delay. We know where each of these people comes from. For example, the first one comes from one half e to the minus 3t. The second comes from, oh, notice that. This is like an s plus one squared. So that would be an shifting well, or exponential wrapper on the t function. Be a e to the minus t times t. One over s squared is t, but replacing the s by s plus one means I struck it with an exponential. And this one right here is minus one half e to the minus t. So let's be very clear, first of all, that you have to decode each one of these, but now you have to respect the exponential wrapper on the outside, which says in English, practice saying this, shift and delay. The shifting, now by A equals one second. The shifting is replacing every T with T minus one. And the delaying is not starting this until T equals one. So that's gonna require a little bit of space. I'm gonna pump up space right here to write my final answer. So here's the delay for one second. Oh, sorry, shift paper up. And now here is the shifted version of this green stuff. One half e to the minus three t minus one plus t minus one e to the minus t minus one, use your parentheses, minus one half e to the minus t minus one. It's true with some common factors. I can be bringing some of these together. These two, not this one, that's a three T right there. But these two could be brought together. On the other hand, do I win? Do I see more by bringing them together? Not really. So I'm gonna leave them there and let's go check our visual matches. Remember, I already had these two pieces decoded. Good. So I think I'm going to pull up my Mathematica notebook. Now, I can type this into Mathematica using the heavy side word right there. It's a mess to type in, but I can type that into Mathematica, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's go get the other Mathematica notebook. Four stamped harmonic oscillators. No, Dirac and Heaviside functions. And let me clean this up. 
before I give it to you because I was playing with some other problems here. Let me enter this problem and I've shown you this notebook before. But it's got a four there, it's got a two there, no, three there. Got a two and a one. And then got it, got it, go. Okay, we can add more pieces as we go. Okay, I don't, I don't know what the state of this is, but let's share it. Share, share, share. That one. Okay, takes me to another desktop. Is everybody looking at the same thing? Yes, can I make this words larger? Yes. Okay, so this is the notebook, Duroc and Heaviside Solutions. It's a copy, so I don't wanna mess with my original. So I don't know if these words apply here because I'm using a different problem. But here is where I will physically type in minus three halves, even though if it takes me a second, exp of minus three t. I'll physically type in what I think the answer is. Plus seven halves exp minus t. And I do any copying and pasting plus heavy side, got it. T minus one, that's u sub one of t times open parentheses, one half. I'm writing my fractions casually because Mathematica understands that. Not using parentheses about my fractions. Now I think I can do a little copy paste stuff here. Copy, so pop, pop, and this will be plus T minus one, minus T minus one, right? And end that, and I did not end the other one. So I've got syntax errors galore here. Want to double check that plus or minus one half x minus stop. I think I've typed this incorrectly. I'll just scan it and then, oh, I need one more parentheses. Okay, now Mathematica has nothing red. So it means at least it makes logical sense what I've typed it may not be what I wanted to type. Okay, but I think it looks good. So that's our proposed answer. We call it capital Y of T to distinguish from our work here. Uh, the heavy side function, I didn't say what the forcing function was. I think I should type the forcing function in here too, because that'll be economical so I can refer to it later. T, so I'm adjusting this worksheet on the fly. My forcing function was two times the heavy side function at T minus one stop x I know you could use it well I'm just going to type x minus t minus 1 so I'm typing this in here so that I can just say y of t and f of t later for example in my numerical solver I just say f of t instead of typing this large expression I got the initial conditions in here. I got the coefficients four, three, two, one. Got it. And now I'm going to evaluate with my y and evaluate my y side by side. Here, let's do this first. Let's just do solution y side by side. Looks good. Notice there's a slight bend at one. And that's when the uh, driving function changes from zero to stuff. I'm going to run this from minus one to three to get more of a view of it. Eight seconds looks perfectly legitimate. Good. Now, side by side, these graphs look exactly the same. 
uh, I think I'm gonna, let's add the driver. Can I see the driver at the same time? Good, now, but the driving function turned red and the solution turned red. So let's do this as red. Now we're gonna play with the colors. Black for driver. Good, there's my driving function. And you see that little bend in the red curve right there. I'm gonna add my driving function likewise black here. This is why it pays to type y of t and f of t above. Good. But I'm, I'm, am I sure this red and blue thing are the same? So now I'm going to add the y of t to my first graph. This is advanced decorating. And I'm going to make the solution light gray and the driver I'll keep as black. It's a second function listed, but I'll make the solution that I invented, the blue solution on the right, I'll make it blue dotted. And light gray colors the first solution, black colors the second solution, but I want two things to be applied to the third solution. I want it to be blue and dotted. And that should give us the effect we want. That is the effect I wanted. So the computer's numerical solution is the gray solution. My solution is the black dotted solution, our solution. So now I have much more confidence that our solution matched. I thought it matched anyway. This is a little bit, you know, good or bad. This is what it means to uh, check in such a case. Let me go back to my paper and show you what I mean. Because how could I differentiate this? Well, I would have to differentiate it in two pieces. Remember, this is just a big old zero until you reach one second. And then after you reach one second, this becomes a one and I just add these five people together. So I could legally differentiate this in two pieces and see that it matches. But I think that's a little too much work. That's a little too much work if I have confidence in my image here and if I entered my image correctly. So I don't mind you double checking your work like we just did right there. But, uh, but bear in mind, it could be sensitively different. Maybe these black dots don't follow exactly and it's hard to see. So this is not a totally legal checking method here. It's just a looks good to me checking method. Okay, good. I like it. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Now, let's try a different problem, a little bit fancier, and particularly one where this forcing function was not pre-prepped for me. So I'm going to decide what do we have to do there, sines, cosines. I'd like to do a problem that involves sines, cosines, right? So let's come up with another problem. Let's not make it too bizarre. And I'm trying to do something that doesn't get too weird. Let's try this, although this is admittedly a little bit simpler than I please, but we'll try harder ones later. But first I want to make you believe that the second shifting theorem can be applied in other cases. So I'm gonna do a straight problem of no damping. Look at how I choose very nice constants, right? The four and the three, don't expect people to do that for you. But I'm just trying to illustrate techniques right now. 
here's a very nice undamped problem with a beautiful, perfect square right there. But let's make this different. This is not looking good for the second shifting theorem. Remember, you gotta do all these things quite legally. So the second shifting theorem, if you're gonna use it, has to look like shift and delay. A little too crowded there, but I don't see shift and delay here. Shift and delay becomes nice in the second shifting theorem. But the point of the email last night is you can have the shifting appear here or you can have the shifting appear here in the right context. So you could also write the second shifting theorem like this. Looks like I'm screwed up because I got no shifting right here. Well then pay it forward. Put your shifting here. Then you have to do T plus A. That is too crowded. I thought I was leaving myself space and I wasn't. So you either see the shifting here, make the match, make the call, second shifting theorem, or you're not, most people that see this the first time say, oh, I'm screwed. I can't do anything because I don't have shifting. No, you can just send the shifting to the other side. And I explained why in the email last night, you need to work through that email. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna do. This is not gonna be bad at all. So I'm gonna do my L double prime, four Ls. I need to assign initial conditions to this. I'll do that in a second. But here I'm gonna take the Laplace transform u2 of t times t. I wanted a fancier function here than t, but this will cause me enough trouble with the sines and cosines. I'll go for a fancier function here on the next example. Uh, we need to bring some initial conditions. How about y of zero equals, here's a good one. Let's go back to our old buddy zero and zero. Make sure you recognize how this works. Oh, by the way, in the previous example, and I did not talk about it after I told you I talked about it, right? Do you see the initial condition is two with a slope of one, probably based on my scale, but I could, I could verify that in a couple of ways. I could draw a line of slope one here if I wanted to. Could put slope fields in here, but that would take more work since it's a second order problem. So we're not gonna do that. Okay, but let's go back to the zero, zero initial conditions and see how they represent in the solution. Okay, now the zero, zero initial conditions are a little bit deceptive because they make this work too easy. Because with zero, zero initial conditions, this is just S squared LY. There's no adjustments to make. Minus S Y at zero, minus Y prime at zero, but they're both zero, right? So, I have to get my window on the right place. Sorry. Okay, now this is plus four. So because of these initial conditions of zero and zero, I could have wrapped this up in one stroke, I think. David, can you scooch the page up a little bit? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So no initial conditions values here makes this nice and so Sometimes I could have just skipped that step entirely and just said S squared plus four LY. Another thing, notice that when you apply the Laplace transforms, isn't this called the characteristic equation? So isn't this called the characteristic equation? So when you're doing the Laplace transform, you're doing the same thing you did with the systems of equations and the eigenvalues eigenvectors. You're also doing the same thing in the E of the ST method. Okay. I'm throwing too much information at you there. Now let's write E minus 2S and do the shifting 
on this side. T becomes T plus two, either minus A beforehand or plus A after. And actually this makes this kind of the more powerful version, especially if you have multiple pieces. I always wanted to add that to my formula sheet and I always forget. Okay, no threats here. Let's see the minus two S, one over S squared, two over S. So now I got my L of Y, make sure I got everything visible, is no initial conditions. So this is just beautiful. It's got my exponential wrapper. S squared, S squared plus four, and S, S squared plus four. Oh, I don't have any particularly pretty partial fraction decomposition tricks. I would just slug this out. I can use the cover up method to get some of the pieces, but not all of them. Remember when I do the partial fraction decomposition here, I'm going to have to have an S squared piece, an S piece. I somehow I predict that S piece dies. And an S squared plus four piece. And in fact, because of the balance right here, I think we could predict those constants easily. Here I have an S and an S squared plus four piece. But what goes on top here is a constant, a constant, but a line goes on top of this. A constant and another line on top of this. Don't have to write all these constants, but you can do these separately. Now let's see, show you what I mean. Oh, excuse me. Just pulled you by the hair there, sorry. Uh, because of the balance and because there's a one here, treat the S squared as if it was just a single variable. I think I just need a one fourth here and a minus one fourth here, and that would be enough. Can you test that? Cross multiply. Uh, the S squareds drop out, the one fourth times four becomes a one. So I'm literally saying B is zero and C is zero in this case. And that was because of the balance between the S squareds. Here, I'm not gonna get that break, but maybe I could use that other trick I showed you. Yes, yeah, so with the cover up method, if I put zero in here, I get two over four is one half. And then, oh, I was going about to say, oh, there's only one constant left, but there's two constants left here. So if I did that trick like plugging in a number, I'd have to plug in two numbers to get two equations. I'm not up for that right now. So let's go test our technology again. Copy. I'm certainly going to test it on both pieces. So uh, one divided by s raised to the two, s, no, s raised to the two plus four. Did I type that incorrectly? You need parentheses around the entire denominator. That's right. I almost had a heart attack there but that matches what we predicted. And then I shave off one of these S's and put a two over here. Is that the other problem? Looks good. There's the one half I thought about. And I did get a one half S. Ha, huh, maybe there was some balance I could have used there, but that's the way it goes. Okay, now, we're going to do the decoding. But, uh, but what I want to say is we accomplished a great life saving right there. That, that was a lot of, that was beautiful. Like shifting can happen in the back or in the front. So that usually derails people a lot. Now the only thing left to understand this problem 
is, let's decode, shift and delay. And I want to see what that mysterious comment meant. How do these zero and zero influence my image? David, can you reshare? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm out of that. Uh, I think, and you guys should experiment this. When I'm sharing one thing, I think you can choose. Can you choose to highlight something else? But you don't, you don't want that. You want that you know. sort of overrode my pen because I have your paper pinned. Yes. But when you then jump in and share Mathematica, my the pin goes small again. It can be, yes. Okay, so now I'm going to decode each of these. This is the preliminary decode. One fourth T. That's what that one is. Of course, that one is not there. Then the decode on this, the preliminary decode. Now, oh, I got it. I guess I have to prep that, don't I? Because this is a sine or cosine, no s, makes it a sine. And I got an angular frequency of two, so I need a two up here. So actually, I need two over s squared plus four. I have to do a little bit of prepping. And then to make the one fourth match, I need a minus one eighth. Now, this is what I mean. This red stuff is partial fraction decomposition. I've made an agreement with you that you never have to show that to me. But this blue stuff, the constant juggling, that's an integral part of the problem that you're learning. So you do have to show me appropriate constant juggling. So minus one eighth, and this is a sine of two T. Then I bring this down, which is a one half times one, one over S comes from one. Now I'm gonna do some work right here, right? Cause this is, it's more pleasant though. This is a cosine transform and the S on top is all I need. It's different than this sine transform. This is last one coming down, minus one half uh, cosine. 2t. Okay, we're doing good for time. This is not my answer. This is the part of my answer that's in this exponential wrapper. So now I have to shift and delay. And this is part of what makes these problems a little bit obnoxious too. The delaying, the extending all the pieces here with replacing t with t minus 2. That makes this a pain to write. So let's write it carefully and only once. Y of t is, turn it on at two seconds. That's the delay part. Move the paper up, excuse me. And what is the shifted part? Let's, let's uh, be proactive to make sure this fits neatly. So I got one fourth of T minus two. And then I got minus one eighth of sine of two times T minus two. And I got one half shifted is still one half. It's a constant function. And then I have minus one half. Looks like I'm going to do well for space. Two times t minus two. So this is what we believe the answer is. And now we can take this to Mathematica and attack it. But do you see where the zero zero comes in yet? You should see it kind of. It's hard to read in formulas. It's going to be obvious to read in the image. Okay, so let me get into here. Uh, okay, for you soccer fans in the audience, England, Germany, zero, zero at halftime. I have to mention that because in my household, they're bugging me, asking me how to watch the England, Germany game. You can't do that unless you're paying for some service. 
let me, where is my Mathematica worksheet that I want to use? Okay, there it is. Okay, so this was successful last time. Let's try it again. Let's type in our uh, proposed solution. I'm just gonna mod this, it's T minus two, but it was a mess afterwards. Oh goodness, one fourth. times t minus two, this is all jumping all over the screen. Sorry, I think I'm just gonna stop that so it's not so cluttered. And then add the other ones, minus one eighth sine, and we can probably take a break. Two times t minus two, just make sure I'm typing in exactly what I promised to type in, square bracket sine plus one half. Now I'll make another comment about simplifying this. I don't really want you to simplify this inside that heavy side function. You know I could simplify and add the one half and the one quarter times t minus two, I can make that a line, but I really don't need to. Cosine two times t minus two, stop. Okay, I think that is good after I add the last parentheses. Notice without that parentheses right there, Mathematica is highlighting and coloring this parentheses red, which means it doesn't think I've finished my typing yet. Now it thinks I finished my typing. I'm gonna scan it to make sure I typed what I wanted to type. That looks correct. Okay, good. Now, uh, let me add my driving function, f of t underscore, that tells Mathematica you're defining function. And what was that function? The heavy side function at two, that's how we write it in Mathematica, times t. Okay, not complicated looking. Let's go execute. And now here, I could put a zero there if I just want to save time. Put four there. F of t, what my initial conditions are, zero and zero. Did you make your prediction yet? for what happens with these initial conditions. Let's keep everything else the same. Maybe I have to modify my window, but let's just pump it and see what happens. Okay, well, this was interesting. Do you see the three functions here? Let me tell you what I see. This is secondary thing. I, I don't need this right now. So why don't I just remove that? Do you see the three functions in this answer? So the driving function is f of t, that's black. So the driving function, look at that, is zero until you get to two seconds and then it kicks in as a line of slope one. Now my units are not one to one here, that's why you have to trace this backwards and see that it goes through the origin. But that is just the line t not turned on until I got to two seconds. So it begins at two, two. And then remember the gray is the computer solution numerically generated. And the black was the solution that we typed in with black dots. I'm sorry, with blue dots. But where is the solution at the beginning? Let me remove the driving function and remove the reference to black so I don't change my color coding. There you go. There's the solution for the first two seconds. Explain why, you can open up a mic if you want, explain why the solution is zero for the first two seconds. Okay, what is this problem? Well, the, the initial conditions, the slope and the driving function were all zero. Good, and that explains what happens at the origin too, because I do see zero value, zero slope at the origin. But why did it continue to have zero value, zero slope? Um, because the second derivative of t is zero, your driving function. I don't know. Uh, you could be legally right there, but let's do it in a more mechanical way. This is an undamped harmonic oscillator that began what? 
in the equilibrium position at rest. So what happens if you put a mass on the end of a slinky and put it in the equilibrium position and resting? It will not move, right? So you got your undamped harmonic oscillator right here. And if I start it in the equilibrium position, I know I'm drawing on my paper, but I'm speaking this too. If I start it in the equilibrium position, not moving, it's just gonna sit there. It's gonna sit there for how many seconds? It's gonna sit there for two seconds until I start forcing it. And when I started forcing it, now let's put back the forcing function. When I started forcing it, what did my damped harmonic oscillator do? Well, it's gonna oscillate, but it's gonna imitate a growing line. So it's kind of oscillating on a increasing slope here. But that's very important to see that for the first two seconds, there was nothing happening. That's what that zero and zero did for me right there. At rest, equilibrium position, nobody is bothering this mass. It's not gonna move. But then I start pumping. Well, I don't, I can't call it pumping. It wasn't sinusoidal, but I start applying the forcing function and the system responds. So we're always looking to visualize things like this system responding to the input, the forced response. The free response in this problem is the first two seconds in a way. If I'd never bothered this system, it would never start moving. I didn't bother it until two seconds. Okay, that's a really good thing to observe. Uh, where, where, where are we? David? Yeah, go ahead. If you don't want to do this, I understand, but can we play what if and change the initial conditions? Oh, yes. That, I know that's you very don't want good. to do it. It's very simple to do, and that's why we like to use Mathematica. So let's, let's set the initial conditions first in a mellow way at one zero. Now, that means my solution won't be good anymore, right? So let's just look at then solution and driver. Right. So I'm going to cut out my solution and cut out the blue dotted and put back the black and put back the driver. So there has got to be the same inclined oscillation because remember there's no damping in this equation ever. But for the first two seconds, I almost get a cycle. Let's put this at a slightly smaller initial condition but still, I've got, and remember, the initial part dies out. Look at this part, it looks the same as my solution, actually. Because if I added my solution in here, the forced response portion would still look very much like that. That's not the same, is it? No, but it's like it. Uh, let me do one more thing. Let's add some velocity to this. Yeah, now that affects the initial inclination, one fourth and minus one. But still, I got to imitate my driving function, which turns on in two seconds. Yes, yeah, so action is happening for the first two seconds. And the first two seconds of action is undamped oscillation. What might be even cooler is to mess with this factor right here. Let's pump that up to 16. Now I get more waves in the initial response and a little bit less incline right there. Now I'm just going to go totally crazy with that damping. Ah, now I see damping for the first two seconds and then damped oscillation taking off at an incline. Oh no, that was a very good suggestion. You can play with all kinds of things visually after you've set up this Mathematica uh, machine. Okay, that's very good. So Let's say, let's go back at, and then we're gonna pick up some fancier sine and cosine action maybe. I think we did what we wanted to do there though. Maybe we'll bring in the drag function after we come back from the break. So let's come back at 107. 
Okay, so I'm going to go back to my paper, but that's an excellent suggestion. You can always play with things like that. Okay, I'm going to mute my microphone while I take a break. And we'll be right back.
Okay. I'm back, excuse me. I'm just checking up on the notes, yeah. Uh, yeah, what we call u of a of t, you can just, Mathematica defines the heavy side theta function to be the unit step function at zero. So to execute a unit step function at a, we just say t minus a, that's right. Okay, got that. Anything else good? I mean, there's no way I'm gonna write this in a problem, right? Let's, this is good enough. Some people do write when they do their works with just a standard function at zero t minus a. So another, another possible notation. Some people write that. Make sure I have enough parentheses in my parenthetical comments. Okay, so where should we go right now? Let's take a look at what we're looking at there. We did do a little sine and cosine action. I think we have to do one more serious sine and cosine action, and then we'll introduce the drag function to show you that the constant juggling can be a serious pain. So let's pick a problem out of the book. Where's my book? And it's really strange. I left my book somewhere else. So, oh, you know what? We have the electronic book, don't we? So let me pull up this book. I want to see if there's a problem I can do with some heavy duty constant juggling. So I'm gonna open the book. I'm looking in section six, two and six, three. So I'll show it to you when I find it. Table of contents, chapter six, two and six, three, really six, three. exercises. That looks unfortunate. That looks unfortunate. Let's try 33. Really, you're only going to love this if you love partial fraction decomposition and constant juggling. But uh, we're going to do the partial fraction decomposition with a machine. Okay, do I have it copied correctly? Yes, initial conditions, yes, let's go. Okay, now here, let's go into, I'm gonna keep numbering my pages. Got it, got it. Let's get into beast mode. And I'm going to incorporate these initial conditions into my Laplace transform of the left-hand side immediately. In fact, I'm going to really get obnoxious and swing them over to the right. So this is taking too many liberties, too many shortcuts. But when you practice, you can do this. Let's see if I can do it. 
So I recognize that when I apply the Laplace transform, I'm going to get the initial condition. I'm, I'm going to get the characteristic equation here. That's what I'm ready for. Now I got to see what I had to pay for the constants. In the second derivative, I had to say minus SY. So when I slide it to the right side, it's going to be plus SY at zero. Then I got to do minus Y prime at zero. When I slide it to the right side, it's going to be plus Y prime at zero. Here's the dangerous one. There's a four that modifies the Y prime. So it's going to be four S times L Y, got it. But it's also going to be subtract four times Y at zero. So when I swing it to the other side, it's going to be plus four times Y at zero. So there I've applied the Laplace transform and incorporated the initial data. That was dangerous. I, I don't, you know, practice doing that if you want, but make yourself notes as you go along. Now I'm going to do this Laplace transform right here. At the 20, on the inside or outside, I really don't mind. I'll probably bring it on the inside in a second. E to the minus 2s times the Laplace transform of sine t. Because I'm applying the second shifting theorem. I convert this to the exponential envelope. And I just had to do the sine of t transpose. OK, so now I'm ready to go. Again, let's save some space. I'm going to swing this over to the other side. This is an S plus 6. Bringing the quadratic on the bottom. The quadratic does not factor. So I'm going to have to do uh, some kind of what, what do you call it? Uh, complete the square right here. So now what do I got right here? I'm going to keep the exponential envelope here. I'm going to swing the 20 inside in a numerator and my denominator. Remember sine of t, here omega is 1. So it's going to be s squared plus 1. That's what it would be right now without dividing by s squared plus 4s plus 9. So I did shorten up this work considerably, maybe more than I should have. You can fill in the gaps. Practice filling in the gaps. OK, now it's time to decode. So unfactorable quadratic, I'm going to work on that. But also, right here, I got to do partial fraction decomposition. So before we do any of that, Yeah, let's just go get the partial fraction decomposition. L of y. I guess I can start completing the square, right? It's not going to slow me down. S plus 2 squared will give me, now you always take half the number in front of the s right there. And then you square it, you get s squared plus 4s plus 4, which I need 5 more here. So pay attention, this omega is root 5, not 5, but root 5. Sorry, move the paper up. And here's an s plus 6. So there's going to be serious constant juggling right here. I got to match the s plus 2. I got to match a root 5 somewhere. Uh, this I'm going to take straight from the machine. And I hope I left myself enough room to write it. So. I need to go to my partial fraction decomposition scratch work, which is right there. And you're seeing it, and that's good. So this is a mouthful to type in. I guess I could over type here, but I'll just type a new line. Uh, S squared plus 1, S squared plus 4, S plus 9. Let's do some modifying, s squared plus 1. Got it. It looks 
correct. And this is what the machine responds. Minus s plus two, s squared plus one. It's gonna be some juggling going on there. And this one's gonna require more, plus s plus two. s squared plus 4s plus 9. OK, looks good. Um, I wrote it on the paper. I'll come back to my paper now and do the advanced constant juggling. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, I got to recover my paper. Here we go. Yeah, so. You can do this efficiently in steps, okay? But, but let's just think about this carefully. What you want to appear here, for example, is you see an S plus two, which means you've got both sine and cosine going on here, the S and the constant, possibly both sine and cosine going on here. But the s plus two means you replace the s squared with an s plus two squared. So there's an exponential thing wrapping that function, not on the outside, but on the inside. So you need to see an s plus two appear on the top to match that s plus two. Now you've done a shifting of plus two and you can recognize the exponential that you used here. This is like saying e to the minus 2t cosine root 5t. Because s over s squared plus 5 would be cosine root 5t. But shifted transform means you had an exponential in front of that cosine. But the problem is these are not equal. You just lopped off four from the numerator. So you got to recover that four. You got to add the four back. But you don't want a four up here. Certainly I could write a four up here and recover my four. But you don't want a four there. You want a root five there. So how, I don't want a root five. I don't want s plus two plus root five. I want s plus two plus four. So I insert the four and remove the root five. There gives me s plus two plus four on the numerator and the denominator is the factored perfect square. So that means that I have four over root five outside exponential wrapper on the inside, sine or cosine, which one? Cosine belongs to the S, sine belongs to the constant. Now that is a mouthful, but that I would call medium constant juggling. I mean, you have to visualize what you want up there. You want an s plus 2 to match this. You want a root 5 to match the 5. And you have to pull it apart and insert the right constant to make it legal. Make sure you double check that this actually adds up to that. Now I'm going to do the same thing here and here. But after I do it, I've got the shift and delay. What color should we use? I've got the shift and delay that I've got to execute on that. So this is really not enough space to do this. So I'm going to move on to another paper. And go like this. 
I'm going to keep this blue stuff here because the blue stuff is finished. You know, that is the first part of the answer because that had no modifiers, no exponential wrapper. So this stuff is finished, but I got to finish this stuff now. So I don't know how this is when you go back and check this drawing out later, but uh, see if you can follow the arrows when you piece these papers together later. What do you need right here? You need an S on top, got it, to match that S squared. You need a one on top to match that square root of one. This is gonna be not too much fanciness right here. The minus sign does belong to the S. So I'm gonna pull that apart like this. Minus S over S squared plus one. That is a cosine transform with omega one plus two times one over s squared plus one. Remember this is one squared and this is one right here. That is a sine transform. Okay, so now I've set this one up with a constant juggling right there. Now let's bring this one down. Maybe I should add some directions for people. This one might do a little more work right here because I got this ugly root five sticking in there, right? S plus two squared plus five. This takes concentration. So the first time you see it looks odd, but let's try it. Oh, this is no fun. I was handed a gift. There's already an S plus two up here. That actually completes this piece and I don't have to break it into two pieces. Well, you understand I'm very disappointed about that. But I still got more work to do, so we'll try to find something fun to do here. Now, remember, that's just the inside of the parentheses. Now, shift, oh, I got to shift and delay. Well, of course I have to shift and delay, but I have to shift and delay what? I have to shift and delay the outcome of these three. The outcome of this one was minus cos t. The outcome of this one was two sine t. The outcome of this one was a cosine root five t, but with a shifted s, e to the minus two t. Now I have to shift and delay this. And now I'm ready to write the final answer. So that paper is going to go away. This is number four. Got it, good. And here's my answer. I might have to actually write the answer on two lines. So first I'm going to write that part of the answer. Rewriting that part of the answer is e minus 2t. So I'm going to be generous left to right and use two lines to write the answer. That way I don't try to cram things. Uh, what was that one? e minus 2t sine root 5t. Okay, good. And then to the next line. So shift and delay this. So plus giant delay of two seconds. Is it two seconds? Yes. Two second delay. Scoot your paper up right a little. There. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just you were writing on the next line and we oh, can't, yeah. there we yeah. go. Yeah. So I've delayed for two seconds, which I see right there. And I see right there. Now let's fill in these people. I have to shift this. So that's minus cosine t minus two, shifted. Now this is not such a bad deal. No exponentials until I get to over here. Sine of t minus two, but I'm using up my space. And this one is e to the minus two times t minus two 
cosine root five t minus two. I don't know what to call this. I, I call this medium bad. This is this wasn't too bad. This came out pretty quickly. On the other hand, part of the reason it came out quickly is because I skipped massive steps in here. You know, you could write for several lines here. So just to clarify, the shift in delay doesn't affect a, a constant term. Correct. Uh, well, let's put it this way. If there was a constant term in there of five, you will delay it. Right, because- But, but shifting it but just shift, turns it into five again. Because you're shift, think of shifting a horizontal line to the right or left. Yeah, you're just moving that horizontal line okay. two seconds to the right. Okay. So, okay. so the delay affects it, but not the shift. Yeah. So what do I got here? I need a nice large parentheses, nice large parentheses. Uh, I guess I'd like to see this graphically. Why not? I don't think I'm going to type this in. I'm just going to have the machine graphically show me the answer and the driver. Because uh, I don't want to type this in right now because I want to move on to something else. But this was a medium nasty one. I think the only thing I think you should think about this, like this is where you're working right here. That took some thoughtfulness. And if you have to do that three or four times over here, that takes some effort. Okay, I'm just gonna type that thing in just to see that it looks like what I hope it looks like. So let's go to a notebook that we have, the Drock and Heaviside notebook, that's right. Open it up. Go find what desktop it's sitting on, which is right there. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to not type in my solution. I'll skip that part. I'm going to type in my driver, which was heavy side at t minus two times sine of t minus two with a 20 hanging out somewhere. Got it. And now let's put in our problem, which was a four here and a nine here, and initial conditions of one and two. And let's see what happens. Okay, the 20 is really wrecking things here, isn't it? Uh, let's make my solution red. Oh, yes. Yeah, let's make my solution red. Uh, can I show this 20 thing going on? But then it's gonna like minimize my solution maybe. Let's find out. That's not too bad. See at two seconds, a sine wave of amplitude 20 kicks in. Notice what happens for the first two seconds. This is a damped harmonic oscillator. It is underdamped if I take out the f of t. It is underdamped, but I don't see the oscillations here because that damping is pretty tight, e to the minus 2t versus sine of root 5t. The damping kind of dominates. Well, maybe if I showed it a different scale, I'd see a little bit of that oscillation. There's a little oscillation right there. And then two seconds kicks in. Let's take out those decimal places. When two seconds kicks in, then here comes my driving function. And what must my solution do? My solution, like a zombie, must what? Imitate and lag the driving function. Isn't that interesting? Zombies must be the horror movie equivalent of forced responses because what do they always do to the humans? They imitate and lag the human. And different zombie movies have zombies that move at different speeds, but they're always kind of imitating and lagging the humans. So now don't, don't have any misunderstandings. If I really was concerned about my solution, which I need to do something else right now, but uh, I could type in the solution very carefully and see that it matches Mathematica's numerical solution right here. Notice I gave Mathematica numerical solution up to 10 seconds. Look what happens if I don't 
give the numerical solution enough seconds. Oh, that's not very exciting. See, there we go. What about this red thing right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> this is not imitating and lagging the black thing. What did I do wrong? I only asked New Mathematica to solve it numerically for four seconds. So after I passed the four second mark, the numerical approximation is no longer valid. So make sure you're doing it enough time, about eight seconds, to make sure that the numerical approximation is valid. Okay, that's a small point you wanna observe. Okay, good. So now we're gonna move on. So you practice that constant juggling. Definitely go to that handout that I created with solutions because I think that would help you learn some things too. Let's look at the Dirac delta function. So I wanna open up six four so we can concentrate on six five next time. We just, we have certainly enough time to open this up, maybe do a problem. So what we wanna do here, we wanna express this in English. Always express what you're doing in English. What we're gonna do right now is take the concept of on off to its extreme. That's one way to look at it. So I've used several analogies, an electrical circuit, a baseball flying through the air. I could consider the baseball to be a damped harmonic oscillator under certain conditions, but uh, that's, not what, that's not what we need to say right now. That, that impulse, the bat striking the ball, just, no, no problem. Uh, impulse, bat striking ball, uh, voltage spike striking your circuit box in your basement or striking lightning strike on a power line. An intense input for a split second Let's define the Dirac delta function. Again, people sometimes call this the Dirac function, they call it a Dirac delta function, impulse function, you adjust. Delta at A, and sometimes people use different notations. But I'm gonna mirror the same notation we use for the heavy side function. T is equal to zero if T is not A, and infinity if T is equal to A. That's already a little bit fishy and a little bit suspicious. What do you mean the value is infinity? As an image, this is what I think it looks like. Got my axes right here. T axis. So let's say, let's put A right there. E R zero. You are zero all the time, except at one moment when you go to infinity. Now, where do I put infinity on this axis? I don't, so I, I, and you're not gonna draw it like this, so don't worry about it. You're really not gonna draw it this way, but I'll put infinity up here. It's above the axis. That's kind of funny sounding, isn't it? But this would be one way I could draw the Dirac function at A, the impulse function at A. And for your moment, for a moment, let's suspend your disbelief about infinity. Like, is that really a value? Are you really allowed to do that? Okay, well, just put that on hold for right now. Let's see if we can make sense of this function. And more importantly, let's see 
if the Laplace transform knows this function. Because let's be pragmatic. If I can't make sense of that function philosophically, but the Laplace transform knows what to do with it, I'm okay with that. Maybe my philosophical understanding will come later. So the fact is the Laplace transform does recognize this function and it's not hard to demonstrate and we will demonstrate it, that the Laplace transform of the Dirac function at A is simply equal to E to the minus AS. That is right here on our worksheet. Now we've covered all these things right here. I did not, uh, this, this, we're not just, we're not running across this right now. So I'm not gonna worry about it. Although you might run across it in future courses. Uh, this would be dealing with an interference in sines and cosines. But if you want to know how to derive these, the derivation is on website. It's not impossible or hard. It's just something we don't need to do right now. So, in fact, I cannot find a problem in the book where he uses these two. At least I haven't seen one. I don't think I've seen one. Okay, so how do we make sense of this? Is this does this make sense? That's what we want to know. So let's figure out how we could do it. Actually, there's a sneaky, silly way you could do this with your calculus knowledge, right? So let's define this. Let's define... Delta A epsilon. Now that's a Greek letter, lowercase epsilon. It is not the same function as I wrote up here. It's a new function. But let's define this in a very clever way. U A of T minus U A plus epsilon of T times one over epsilon. It's got so many Greek letters in it, so many letters in fact, and there's not a single number in this, that it looks mysterious, but it's not mysterious. Let's, let's talk about it. First of all, you know that UA minus UB means turn on at A, turn off at B. So that's going to be looking like this. And I'm, I really intend epsilon to be a tiny number, like a tenth, a thousandth, a millionth, but I'm going to exaggerate the scale here. At A, I'm going to turn it on. At A plus epsilon, sorry, move my paper up. I'm going to turn it off. So this distance right here is epsilon. And it looks like this. Zero, one, zero. That's that part. Now let's understand what the one over epsilon does. You know, whatever if this is a 10th, what's one over epsilon? 10. If this is one 100th, epsilon is one 100th, then this is 100. To get a feeling for what's gonna happen now. If epsilon is super tiny, then one over epsilon is super large. So I could, instead of one right here, let me write one over epsilon. But with the understanding that as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, I'm not even going to label these. Then I'm going to be zero outside that interval and huge inside that interval. This hugeness would be one over epsilon. I said I wasn't going to label them, but I guess I'm going to label it. And the two endpoints of that interval would be A and A plus epsilon. 
Now that's starting to look like infinity to me, right? Now it's not infinity, but let's say epsilon was one one millionth. Then this height would be one million. And then we could argue whether one million is infinity or not. But I can say this from my casual calculus language. As epsilon goes to zero from the right, as epsilon is smaller and smaller positive numbers, I feel that delta A epsilon function is becoming more and more like delta A. That's what I want to say. That if I could put these side by side, I can't really do that under the camera. This is the delta A epsilon. This is the delta A. As epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, delta A epsilon becomes delta A. But that's not the end of the coolness. Because of this simple form, I know what the Laplace transform does to delta A epsilon. What is the Laplace transform of delta A epsilon? It is equal to the constant one over epsilon times the Laplace transform of UA of T minus UA plus epsilon of T. We'll do a little calculus work here for a second. You know the Laplace transform of UA of T is E to the minus AS one over S. You know that the Laplace transform of this, just call this B if you like, is e to the minus b s one over s. And then attached to that, you have a one over epsilon. So this is calculus knowledge that I'm not going to justify. I'm just going to use. It probably sounds extremely believable to you, but you know, if I was a lawyer or something, I'd have to do it very nicely, right? So as epsilon goes to zero, a, delta A plus epsilon goes delta A. So I claim, and I won't demonstrate it legally. So the Laplace transform of delta A epsilon also goes to the Laplace transform of delta A. This will be how we define the Laplace transform of delta A. Now you think about this for a second, this looks like a horrid mess, but you do see some common things going on here. So let me write this a little bit nicer. E to the minus AS minus E to the minus A plus epsilon S. We're even going to simplify that. But the bottom is just S epsilon, right? Got denominators here, but the denominators are simple. Common denominator of S out here, common denominator of epsilon. Now what I'm gonna do right here is use my algebra language to say E to the minus AS minus E to the minus AS, E to the minus S epsilon. Because remember common base add exponents, that's what you would get. You've seen us pull that trick before. The benefit of that is that I get to remove the e to the minus as. And write 1 minus e to the minus s epsilon over s epsilon. And remember, this is the Laplace transform of delta a epsilon. But now you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to let epsilon go to zero. I'm going to take the limit because epsilon goes to zero from the right. The from the right part is not fancy here. It just means I want epsilon to be a positive number. So what do I got? Epsilon going to zero. Oh, zero in the bottom. Whoops. One minus one in the top. Oops. L'Hopital's rule. Epsilon goes to zero plus. This e to the minus as has nothing to do with epsilon. So it just sits there and watches. 
right? But now I use L'Hopital's rule and say, if I don't know this limit, if this limit is indeterminate, I can take the derivative of the bottom with respect to epsilon and take the derivative of the top with respect to epsilon. Careful with your constants. Epsilon is the variable here. So the derivative of the top with respect to epsilon bring down a minus s. But you see what happens? Those s's cancel. And as epsilon goes to zero, this goes to a one. And all that's left is this person that was sitting outside. So now we've demonstrated that the Laplace transform of the impulse is e to the minus as. Awesome. Laplace transform understands understands the impulse function. Now we got just a couple of minutes. I can crank out one fast and happy differential equation because I want you to see the physical result of the impulse. So let's go for a simple, simple differential equation. Y prime, let's go back to our friendly neighborhood exponential decay. But then let's take an impulse at three seconds. and give some initial conditions, well, one initial condition, one derivative here, mellow initial condition, y of zero is, I've used a two, a three, why don't I use a four? Okay, quick execution, plus y prime equals minus two plus y plus the plus impulse at three, very quick execution, beautiful picture. SLY minus four, that's the compensation, minus Y naught, plus two LY, when I bring the LYs to this right, left side, and here's E to the minus three S. And now let's look at what the plus transform becomes from a what? Algebraic point of view, I'm sorry, what the impulse becomes from an algebraic point of view. From an algebraic point of view, what's this e to the minus 3s? It's an exponential wrapper that's going to accept the 1 over s plus 2. So first I have 4 over s plus 2, and then I have the exponential wrapper on 1 over s plus 2. But this is a first order problem, so it's not exciting but I want it to be visual, right? So now no constant juggling involved here. This is four e to the minus two t. And this was from e to the minus two t, but I got a shift and delay, shift and delay. So the delay is three seconds. And the shift is e to the minus two times t minus three. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's take this to our, let's take this directly to our thing and then we can wrap it today. Uh, got my solver over here. In fact, I think I could use it direct solver, and I could type in my equation, I could give this the full treatment. Uh, and here's where you meet the Dirac function. Mathematica calls delta A the Dirac function at t minus A. So that's delta sub three. That's my driver. Oops, sorry, I want to add my proposed solution, which was not hard to type in, 4x minus 2t stop plus heavy side. Dirac function, heavy side function always work together. And tomorrow we'll tell you exactly 
why that seems to be the case. It's not a coincidence. Uh, but you saw the drag function was made out of heavy side functions, so maybe that doesn't seem like a coincidence to you. X minus two T minus three stops stop. Okay, got it, got it. Let's make sure I'm keeping track of that. Thank you, got it. Uh, what was my, I don't need this Y double prime stuff. I was just doing a single Y prime. Uh, plus two Y if I had swung that minus two Y to the other side. Here's my driver. I don't need the initial condition for Y prime. There is none. And I had put a four here. Let's just pop it and see what happens. Okay, not a remarkable picture, but I do have a crazy scale here. Let's drive this down to minus five to five. I got that little red thing going on, that vertical thing. I don't like that, but that's probably a consequence of my typing. Uh, where's my driving function? I think what I need is driving function and solution, my solution. Got it, so I got their solution. I got my solution. No, so I didn't execute some line here. That's what this means. Okay, and black, and let's make mine blue dotted again. And let's make the machine solution light gray again. Something is not happening like I want it to happen yet. What is this black f of t? f of t is the Dirac function. Oh, now I see what's going on. Uh, yeah. The black line is the drag function, but Mathematica doesn't know how to graph infinity any more than we do. So what is the drag function? It's always zero, except at three. And what happens at three? At three, this solution gets a kick. Let me remove the driver. Just look at my solution my solution and the machine's numerical solution. Notice it's my solution that has the blue dots with no vertical line, but the mach machine tries to connect the dots. It's reminiscent of what calculators do. What kind of problem is this? This is straight exponential decay, right? And then by the time I get to three seconds, the solution is very small. But then I take a hammer and I strike this solution. And is it a coincidence that the striking rises me to level one? Takes a one unit jump. I will have to think about that. But then what happens after the lightning bolt strikes? I go back to exponential decay. In fact, if I really wanted to have fun, so permit me to do this. As you said, we could experiment with these. Let's put in a second order problem right here. Drock function. And now my solution is no longer valid. So I'll remove that and I'll remove that and put an F there. And no, I'm not even gonna put an F there because oh, we, don't, we don't see anything. So let's just look at solution in red. Oops. No, I didn't execute something. Okay, got it. Got initial, oh, I didn't have initial condition, Y prime. Y prime at zero is one. Okay, so I am making somebody unhappy right here. No arguments. Oh, I needed a T right there, sorry. Mathematica tried to tell me what I did wrong. Look at that, for three seconds and then I kick it. But what would happen if I kicked it four times as hard? Gets a bigger kick. What happens if I kick it four times as hard as in the opposite direction? Gets a kick downward. What happens if I kick it at three seconds and kick it at five seconds and kick it at six seconds? With different directions 
and different well let's just try it out Dirac function at three five and six seconds what do I got damp harmonic oscillation till three seconds get a kick return to damp harmonic oscillation five seconds get a kick don't get much time to return six seconds get another kick down Imagine trying to solve for this equation in red here, uh, analytically, you know, give me a formula. Well, you could give me a formula. You could give me a formula like we just did on the paper, but it would be intense, you know, different sections, hard to describe one piece at a time. Okay, I think that's a really good setup for next time and that positions us really nicely for next time so thank you for being patient uh, but you have a feeling for what the direct delta function does actually the direct delta function is kind of nice to work with because it's just a simple exponential wrapper uh i'm going to hit the record i'm going to stop recording and hang out for a second